this presentation, we're going to discuss ocean and coastal processes. So first, it's important to note that our oceans, despite the fact that they are oftentimes discussed as being isolated uh, and in that we name them differently and discuss them differently and um, really kind of have different conservation as well as management practices in these oceans, uh, the wor world is really on a global ocean conveyor belt. And there are large scale movements of water into the ocean basins. That is driven specifically by the cooling and sinking at the polar regions, as well as the winds at the surface or surface circulation. And in this image here, you can see that uh, that global kind of conveyor belt of ocean, uh, ocean water movement has a consists of a warm water surface flow uh, that occurs in the Pacific Northwest region or so and follows all the way down through the Indian Ocean, or the bottom of the Indian Ocean, and up through the Atlantic. And then in the North Atlantic Ocean is where we find uh, this kind of sinking of water. And, and essentially this is going to turn into subsurface cooled water that is much colder and denser and thus is uh, traveling more deeply throughout the oceans. Um, part of that water drifts up into the Indian Ocean. Another kind of stream of that water flows uh, back up into the Pacific Ocean. So the North Atlantic region here is where you have warm saline waters that cool and sink, and the Indian and the Pacific Ocean are where we have deep, cold water returning to the surface. Now, there's something called the Coriolis, Coriolis effect that is uh, responsible for driving a lot of this. And the Coriolis effect is, consists of a rotation of the Earth, um, wherein the patterns of weather and currents are going to be causing fluids to curve around as they travel the surface of the Earth. This movement of fluids due to the circling and circumnavigation of the planet is going to be occurring faster at the equator than at the poles. Uh, so in the northern hemisphere, the currents are also going to be deflected to the right, um, whereas in the southern hemisphere, the currents are going to be deflected to the left. So because of this kind of continual movement around our axis, we have this shifting in the path of those uh, currents. We also can talk about thermohaline circulation and need to understand that to really understand what's happening with the ocean water movement. So essentially, water is density driven in terms of its circulation throughout the oceans. The, the uh, thermo part of this thermohaline circulation refers to the word heat or temperature, and the haline aspect refers to salinity or, and corresponds to density uh, within that water column. So in this figure here, we have Antarctica over on the left-hand side of the figure, and we have, um, we have the equator in the middle, and then we have uh, the North Pole, essentially, over on the right-hand side of the figure. And here you can see that there's this kind of trend with respect to the, the uh, composition of the temperature and the density of the water um, that differs from the south versus the north. So at the equator, we have this Gulf Stream. We have this warm saline water that's going to shift northwards. Um, it's going to essentially, at the North Atlantic, it's just kind of another image of that. It's like a slice of the pie as opposed to looking at the entire ocean there. In the North Atlantic waters, that water is going to kind of sink and turn into what we call the North Atlantic deep water. Um, in the Southern Ocean, we have uh, this also kind of density and cold and dense water that sinks down towards the bottom of the ocean floor. And um, if it's derived or, or started in Antarctica, we refer to that as Antarctic bottom water, which is very, very, very cold. Um, so the colder and more dense water tends to sink um, sink to the bottom, whereas uh, warmer water is going to be more towards the surface. So if we take a look at this figure here, uh, this is a, a temperature as well as salinity profile that are kind of paired together here. And we basically can get an idea regarding what's driving that density. So in this, in this particular figure, we have temperature in degrees Celsius along the x-axis, top x-axis, for the left side of this graph. And then we have um, 
salinity values along the x-axis uh, on the right-hand side. We also have this uh, depth profile or depth in meters along the y-axis here. I think that's in meters. Yeah, in meters. Um, so in the surface, you can see that there's warmer water that's occurring. Um, each of these lines, by the way, is corresponding to different basins, the Canadian Basin, the Inletsen Basin, Greenland Sea, um, and that corresponds to both salinity and temperature profiles here. So it's showing you that there's variability in different ocean basins or different seas. Um, so, but you st still do get some fluctuations in temperature and variability in temperature. Uh, with an increase in that temperature occurring in the Atlantic water here in this blue shaded area, which is corresponding to kind of an increased salinity um, over on the right-hand side. Now, salinity is going to increase dramatically in the first 200 meters, and then as you get to about 400 meters, it's going to level off and remain consistent down to the seafloor. However, what's going to happen to the temperature is that there'll be an increase in that temperature up through about this... Uh, 400 meter or so, 500 meter uh, in this figure, 400 meters, 500 meters or so. And then we see a dramatic dip in that temperature. And we see it get increasingly cold as we get deeper. So this cold temperature really takes over for the salinity in terms of making the water um, more dense. So the de salinity kind of stays consistent, remains consistent, whereas the So we, we see that at some point in time, there's a, uh, a, a consistency with respect to the salinity in the deep ocean waters. Um, but what we'd see different in the temperature is that continually decreases. And that's going to be uh, responsible for making that deep cold water, or it's going to result in that deep cold water being quite dense. Um, so here we just have a profile where we can kind of see that outlined and it's almost as if you had taken a slice of the ocean in order to look at those profiles. Now in this figure, we see the currents as they are moving across that global ocean conveyor belt. And as you can see, the, the clearer kind of white ones are going to be surface water. Um, again, that's going to dip down in the North Atlantic and it's going to shift down into that, um, into that deeper part of the ocean basin. Um, so it really allows for there to be this consistent motion and movement of water throughout the conveyor belt. So it's funny how we think of things in terms of our ocean waters being isolated. And if we, you know, take some conservation measure or whatnot in the United States, that's, you know, going to help our waters. But truly, you can see in this image how that water is really just circulating throughout the ocean. So it's um, hard to really isolate anything in terms of uh, any effective conservation measures when it comes to things like plastic pollution and things like that. All right, so um, temperature versus density. We generally find that as temperature increases, there's more space between the molecules. Um, so there's, which means that there's basically uh, less density to it. So when something gets really cold, uh, it's because all the molecules are a bit closer together, whereas when it heats up, there's going to be more space between those molecules. So density is going to decrease when we have this warmer kind of temperatures. Um, in this particular figure, we have sea surface temperature in the map on the top there, and the red corresponds to warmer kind of 30 degree centigrade temperatures. The blue corresponds to this, this colder zero or negative two degree waters, uh, so very, very cold. And as you can see, the sea surface density here on the, on the bottom map figure, um, which is in kilograms per meter squared, the deep blue there uh, is going to be a more dense water uh, at the sea surface, whereas the lighter blue are going to be, uh, are going to be corresponding to less dense, dense surface water. Um, so as you can see, it gets colder here in the North Atlantic, and that's where it gets uh, a bit deeper, uh, darker blue, so more dense. Same thing with the kind of Southern Ocean, Southern regions of the Earth. And then in the warmer sections, you can see that's corresponding to these, these areas where um, we have a, a 
lower sea surface density. Salinity versus density is a little bit different. So as salinity increases, there's more salt molecules in the water, so density is going to increase. Um, so in this particular figure, again, we have a map of the globe, and um, you can see that the darker, darker colors here correspond to uh, sea surface salinity, like a lower sea surface salinity, and a higher sea surface salinity is going to correspond to uh, the lighter shades of green. So we have this higher sea surface salinity in the warmer regions, and that's corresponding to, again, this, uh, this lower sea surface density. Um, sea surface, surface currents can consist of, or sorry, can be basically driven by global wind patterns. Um, these are global wind patterns are caused by atmospheric circulation and this Coriolis effect. Um, we kind of talk of these in terms of trade winds and westerlies. And if we take a look at this map, we can see that we have these consistent kind of um, currents that are occurring in each of the ocean basins. So we have this global conveyor belt, and now we see that there's these kind of counterclockwise movements of currents within the northern and the southern hemispheres of these different ocean basins. So um, we also find that in the oceans, open oceans, we have something called gyres. These are major spirals of currents that occur in the north and southern hemisphere due to the Coriolis effect. And um, in, the, in the Pacific Ocean, I'm sorry, in the Pacific Ocean, we have a couple example, or example of the, uh, the North Pacific and the South Pacific gyre. Uh, and in the Atlantic, you can kind of see in this figure below, we have an example of the North Atlantic and South Atlantic gyre. There's also another gyre which is located in the Indian Ocean. So in addition to these, it's kind of like layering, right? You've got this conveyor belt, and then you've got these, um, these gyres, these large gyres that are moving throughout the current currents that are moving throughout these uh, different northern and southern hemisphere basins, which again are driven by the fact that we have, you know, our Earth circulating as well. So, coastal currents. There's several types of coastal currents that occur as well. Um, so it's just another layer here. We have waves, which you guys are all familiar with. There's also something called longshore currents, rip currents, and upwelling. So let's touch on each of those. So waves are going to be um, basically characterized by the surface. They're driven by surface winds. The direction of the wind travel is what's going to kind of force the direction of those waves. And we have different ways of characterizing those uh, different waves. So we can talk about wave frequency or the number of wave crests passing point A each second. Um, and then the wave period, which is the time it's required, that's required for the wave to pass point A. I'm sorry, passing point A to reach point B. Um, we can refer to that as the wavelength as well, each, the point A to point B, so the crest to the crest of the wave. And we refer to wave height as the distance from the trough to the crest of the, um, of the uh, particular wave. So uh, wave height is going to be affected by things such as wind speed, wind duration, distance over water in a single direction, uh, or something called the fetch. The other thing to note is that you can um, actually you know, evaluate this. Uh, these, there's a lot that goes into buoys and sensors for evaluating things such as wavelength and frequency and the amplitude of that wave. And um, a lot of that can be useful for kind of predicting storms and things along those lines when there's significant changes in those values. Longshore currents correspond to, or are basically defined as waves that reach a beach or a coastline and release bursts of energy that generate a current along the shore. This is affected by the seafloor and the shoreline features. So it's this longer, it's this bigger current that's kind of moving towards the shore and as it interacts with that bottom surface, it's going to cause those kind of waves and currents to affect the water. Uh, the other important element of that is the uh, 
we have what we call a downstream movement of those longshore currents, and there's going to be a net movement of sand grains that, uh, that are going to shift along with that longshore drift. Um, you probably have felt this before if you've been at the beach, and you're right in front of your blanket, and you look up after a while, and you've kind of shifted down a ways. Um, that has to, that basically is being, you're being forced into that by this longshore current. Rip currents are another form of longshore current that are, uh, occur around low spots and sandbars and jetties. They are a localized current that flows away from the shoreline. Uh, they tend to be quite narrow, so less than 25 meters or about 25 meters, and they tend to be very, very fast. So in this figure here, we have um, currents that are heading in either direction that meet and result in this movement of water, the fast, rapid movement of water directly offshore. Um, you can actually discuss the, and this, what was I going to say? You can also, <laughs> what do you call it? Dissect, <laughs> dissect this rip st current structure. And we talk about this, this kind of spot where the two currents interact as the feeder portion of the rip current. The neck is the part which is going to have that rapid drift out to, out to sea. And the head is where um, that, the meeting of those two currents is going to relax and the rip current is basically going to kind of dissipate. Um, this tends to be quite uh, forced by this onshore flow as well. So this tends to be um, quite far offshore, which is why they can be quite dangerous. Upwelling is where we have um, an artifact of water movement that occurs along the coastline. It's going to be perpendicular to wind that pushes water away from an area, and uh, the surface water is going to be replaced. So the subsurface water is going to be nutrient-rich and quite cold. And in this figure, if we kind of look at that a little bit closer, we've got this surface wind pushing water kind of away from an area. And as that water gets pushed away and kind of horizontally and parallel to the shore there, um, you have this deeper, colder, nutrient-rich water. Because remember, we've got this nutrient cycle happening and carbon and all sorts of things is basically going to be relocating after animals die and defecation occurs and all that into the subsurface uh, and along the seafloor. So that deep, colder nutrient water is going to rise up from beneath the the surface to replace the water that's pushed away. And this is something we call upwelling. Um, we also have warmer surface water moving offshore in this particular instance, in these particular um, scenarios. Now remember, this is all driven by the winds. So if the wind is moving in a certain direction, then that's obviously going to uh, result in this upwelling not happening. Um, we also have something called equatorial upwelling, which is where we have these trade winds that are kind of meeting in the middle and running, you know, coming out of these different different um, current patterns. These trade winds at the, at the equator are going to be kind of uh, converging, that's what I was looking for, converging and resulting in the movement of the surface water away from the center line here along the equator and that nutrient warm or nutrient rich water is going to kind of move up along the the um, the equator. So equatorial upwelling is something that occurs uh, um, pretty regularly. Um, the opposite by the way of this upwelling is something called downwelling which is where the wind causes a buildup of water that sinks so you get warm water sinking as a, and that's going to be nutrient poor and also not very beneficial for a lot of organisms in terms of uh, food and whatnot. All right. Tides are going to be referred to as the rise and fall in the sea level, resulting from gravitational attraction of the moon and the sun. Um, so as we have uh, in our earth here, we have these high tides and we find these low tides. We Interestingly enough, the gravitational pull of that moon is going to be what's resulting in these higher tides existing. Um, most coastal areas are going to experience two low tides and two high tides every lunar year, or 24 hours and 50 minutes or so. Um, and the reason why there's a tidal bulge, or this kind of 
increase in the tide has to do with a greater gravity, greater gravity than the center of the Earth. So there's a greater gravitational pull by the moon than that center of the Earth. Um, this can change based on the orientation of that moon. So when the moon is in between the sun, we have a gravitational pull of uh, the moon plus the sun. Uh, and that's going to result in some very high and very low tides because you've got two celestial structures kind of gravitationally pulling against that water on our Earth. If they're kind of perpendicular to one another, then you have uh, more of a kind of even, I guess, moderate to low tidal movement. Um, when there's a gravitational pull in the opposite direction of the moon and the sun, then um, you're also going to it's also going to result in some higher tides uh, because there's the same pole just on either side. And then when you have, again, this perpendicular orientation, you're going to have something called a neap tide, which is going to be relatively weak. Um, oftentimes the tidal, the tides within a region, so you can't, in San Diego here we have uh, typically speaking, two high tides, two low tides within a 24-hour period. That's going to change depending on what part of the world you're in. Um, so there's something called a semi-diurnal set of tides, which is what we experience here in Southern California. Um, there's a mixed semi-diurnal kind of tide structure, um, which in this figure, this map behind us is represented by the purple lines here. I guess we kind of have a mixed one, don't we? Yeah, whoops. <laughs> So we don't have a straightforward one. <laughs> I guess ours is a little bit mixed. Um, and then you have just something called a diurnal uh, tide, which is represented by the yellow here. So a little bit different in terms of the patterns. Um, tides can result in additional currents. So we find this being really important for places like estuaries and salt marshes. Um, this flood current can move water from the ocean into those regions and an ebb current is going to pull water out of those regions and if you've ever passed by any of our lagoons or estuaries you've seen this kind of effect of the water being low or high. Uh, finally there's a few California influences that we tend to talk about or hear about in the news. Uh, one of those being the California current uh, the California Current runs southward along the western coast of North America from British Columbia down to south, southern Baja, California. And this California Current is, is uh, uh, pretty influential in terms of the upwelling that occurs along the coast and, um, and is responsible for a lot of the assemblages of organisms within those regions. Also, we have an artifact called El Nino that we tend to um, have a quite there tends to be quite a significant impact on our San Diego and California coastal communities. And here's just a short video that talks a little bit about El Nino. A natural force of nature unlike any other, El Nino is capable of unleashing a fury of climate changes and natural disasters that spread from Alaska all the way to South America and beyond. What causes El Nino? And how are we affected by it? El Nino is not a storm, but rather a weather phenomenon in the Pacific Ocean. During an El Nino, the surface water temperature warms up, leading to complex weather patterns. South American fishermen in the 19th century, describing warmer waters during Christmas time, coined the name El Nino, Spanish for the Blessed Child. Nowadays, when sea surface temperatures in the equatorial Pacific Ocean rise 0.5 degrees Celsius over their historic average for three consecutive months, and once atmospheric conditions and rainfall patterns shift accordingly, scientists officially declare an El Nino. An El Nino event takes place about every two to seven years. Normal east to west trade winds over the Pacific weaken, and warm water that normally travels westward is now moving toward the east. Moisture then rises into the air, and the effects of El Nino are felt throughout the Americas. In the ocean, warm water pushes colder water downward, blocking the important upwelling of nutrient-rich waters from the bottom. This causes some marine life to migrate to colder water. 
Animals that normally feed on the sea life suffer, and fisheries throughout Central and South America suffer too. But El Nino's most noticeable repercussions are felt on land. In the western United States and Central and South America, the warm air and moisture lead to increased storms, rainfall, floods, loss of life and property, and the increase of some vector-borne diseases like malaria, even in places where they don't normally occur. In Southeast Asia and Australia, the opposite takes place. These areas suffer from drought, wildfires, and colder ocean waters. In 1997 and 98, the world experienced the biggest El Nino in recorded history. Some estimates blame that El Nino for 2,100 deaths and $33 billion in damages. Mongolia saw temperatures reach 108 degrees Fahrenheit, there was record flooding in Peru, and the U.S. saw storms in the Gulf Coast, flash flooding from California to Mississippi, and tornadoes in Florida. Scientists are now better able to predict if and when an El Nino event will take place. This helps communities better prepare for the changes in weather patterns and better adapt to its repercussions. All right, so that is just a little bit about ocean and coastal processes. Hope you enjoyed.